Thank you, Jesus. There we go. Amen. We come to lift the Lord's name on high. <laughs> we came to lift his name not in the middle. We didn't come to lift up his name just a little bit. We didn't come to lift his name above just only our problems. We came to lift his name on high. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Let us stand. Let us labor before the throne as we prepare to come boldly before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. We are here to magnify God on today. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you today, oh Lord, and we are thankful. We are so thankful, God. Lord, we didn't have to see this day. This day was not promised to us. For we could have woken up on today, oh God, and realized that it was our time to not be here anymore. So we just thank you on today, oh Father. We are thankful that we have another opportunity to get it right with you. We thank you for the healing of our bodies. We thank you for the soundness of our mind. We thank you for the activity of our limbs. We thank you for your son's saving grace yet again. Lord, we are here to lift your name on high. Lord, we are here to have victory, not only in our natural lives, but in our spiritual lives. We are here to have success in you, oh God. For only in you can there be success. For only in you can there be victory. We are here to receive it on today. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you and we ask you to do all of these things. Lord, I want to speak to the hurting heart on today. Lord, I want to speak to the, 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 the man or the woman that needs a second or a third chance, oh God. Lord, I want to speak to the brokenhearted on today. Lord, I want to speak to the one who feel like no matter what they do, no matter what they try, they're always falling short. Your promises are yes and amen. You have made yourself known to those who diligently seek you. You are a rewarder of them who diligently seek you. Oh God, reward us on today. And we will be blessed. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Thank God and amen. While you're standing, if you got your Bibles or you want to just look at the screen, amen, I want you to turn your Bibles, turn your phones, slide your Bible apps. Whatever it is that you got to the book of Genesis, the 22nd chapter, Genesis 22. And amen. We're going to start at the first verse. We're going to read the first two verses and then we're going to jump to the ninth verse. And read verses 9 through 13. So we're going to go 1, 2, 9 through 13. Amen. And the word of the Lord reads, <coughs> and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Let me jump to the ninth verse. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he, the angel said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, 
seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in, st in the stead of his son. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We are, we are here on today. And I'm so glad to see each and every one of you. My, my sister is here on today. Amen. I, I had to shout her out because I haven't, I haven't seen my sister since was it Thanksgiving. She you know, went off to college and she kind of, she trying to do the school thing and she's, She's going to be all right, but it's, it's, it's kind of different not seeing sis on the regular when you're used to seeing sis on the regular. I have to be honest, I miss my babysitter. Hey Amen. I got four little ones, and so I'd be like, Lauren, I need you to watch them. And she's, a lot of times she's like, yeah, I can do it. I got you. And so I haven't, I haven't seen her. It's been a couple of weeks, but it feel like I ain't seen her in a while. Hey Amen. So it's just good to see her. Give her a hand on today. <coughs> Sister Lauren is with us, amen, and I see uh, Brother Joe, he brought a, a visitor on today, amen, and I just want to say thank God for her on today. Give me your name again, Brianna, 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 good to have Sister Brianna on today. Give her a hand, amen. We want to welcome you and to all of our visitors who may be with us online, uh, we want to say welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We are here. We are at the conclusion. Oh, I know you didn't know that. We are at the conclusion of our Checkmate series. Amen. We have been um, learning and, and dealing and doing, and we've been learning about uh, how to be, uh, I want to say, a winner, how to be victorious in God. We've learned about uh, the board. We've learned about uh, the pieces we've learned about the influences in this life, in this game of chess. Amen. And um, now we are here and we are coming to our big old finale. Amen. And so I need us to be just a little, just a little different today than we have been. Amen. And what I mean when I ask you to be different is I need you to go with a little bit of excitement today. Amen. I've been up here and I've been standing firm and I've been flat footed and I've been somber and I've been cool as a cucumber because that's what was required. That was what was needed. Amen. Is every week is not, we're going to sweat until our hair falls out until we got to change clothes before we leave the building. Sometimes we just kind of got to hear the word and we got to absorb the word and we got to begin to let the word do what it needs to do within us. Amen. But today, today, I need us to have just a little bit of fire, a little bit of excitement, a little bit of happiness, because today we're going to figure out how to win. Amen. Today we're going to figure out how to get the victory that we have been so longing for. Today we're going to figure out how to really, I hear people say it all the time, today we're going to really find out how we can knock the devil upside his head, as they used to say in the old church. Amen. And so um, today's title within the Checkmate series, if you can see it, is The Success of Sacrifice. The success of sacrifice. So before I start reading and doing all of that, um, a lot of times this is the, the one thing that I don't even want to limit this to the believer. I want to limit this to people, to mankind in general. The one thing that mankind struggles with in any and everything is sacrifice. We don't want to sacrifice anything. But, but, if you go and you, you, you study on those who have been successful or have had any level of success in their life, you'll find sacrifice any and everywhere. Amen. As a matter of fact, I, was, um, I went last month, me and my wife, uh, we went to see um, Black Panther. Went to see Black Panther. Now, if you know me, you know I am a superhero comic book 
I'm a geek in that area. I love them all. I, I do everything. You don't believe me? I have on Batman socks. But the the the, the point is is I, I I have a history of studying the comic book world, the comic book verse. And so what I learned, and I told this to my wife, um, is for all superheroes, in order to, a part of their journey, a part of them becoming regular to super, they have to lose somebody. Somebody dies. Amen. It's, it was just a common theme. I'm not, don't get scared. I'm not telling y'all in order to be successful, y'all got to kill somebody. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I just, I learned it, it's a part of the sacrificial area that I'm in. Batman had to lose his parents. Superman lost the whole world. The Flash lost his mom. So, and when we went to go see Black Panther, and they made, y'all all seen the movie, right? Okay. And th- y- did you see the movie, Brianna? I don't want to spoil it. I ain't going to spoil it. Blurry. So, the person that became and took up the mantle of Black Panther, I'm not going to say no names or nothing like that. Oh, you know already? Oh, go ahead. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> Brandon ain't seen it yet. I'm going to be nice. The person who became and took up the mantle of Black Panther uh, didn't meet the, the hero requirement is what I call it. They didn't meet the hero requirement, not because they were not smart enough, but they hadn't lost that person yet. Is that all right? And so there was a part in the movie where they had lost their, their mom in the movie. And, and my wife, when we were discussing about it afterwards, I was like, I didn't see that coming. I said, you had to see it. And she says, what do you mean? I said, they hadn't lost the person that was going to mess with their emotional status enough for them to have to choose whether they were going to be a hero or they they were going to go out for revenge. It hadn't happened yet. And so what am I saying here? In in, in everything in life, if you want to have success at it, you're going to have to sacrifice something. My sister's in college. She's learning this now. You want to have good grades, you're going to have to sacrifice some sleep. You want to get your stuff done, you're going to have to sacrifice time with your friends. You, you're going to have to sacrifice something in your personal to get to what you want or what is called for you. Amen. The word sacrifice in uh, the Hebrew is kordan. It's kordan, which means to draw near. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, the sacrifices of the Jews, it was to atone for sin and it was their way to draw closer to their God. So so when God asked for a sacrifice, he wasn't really just asking for you to give up something. He was asking, can you come closer to me? I desire to be closer and more connected with you. So can you give up this in order to be closer to me? Because everything that you have, you cannot take to God. Is that all right? Everything that we have in this earth, everything that is in us, we cannot take with us to glory. Amen? Amen. So, we have, um, we've been on the defensive. We've been in the learning. We've been in the classroom. It's time to go on the offensive. Not the offensive, the offensive, amen? It's both the same, two different meanings. We're not here. It's not time for us to go and be offensive to people, but it's time for us to pick up the ball and run with it. It's time for us to get in attack mode, amen? We have, it's time for us to step out of our comfort zone. It is time for us to step out of our fear. It is time for us to uh, step out of our defensive stance, and it is time for us to understand the true meaning of struggle. It's time to attack. It's time to attack. Amen. It's no longer time for us to stand in complacency, but now it's time for us to get up, move, and do something about it. Is that all right? I got a friend of mine, um, he got like a little t-shirt line, and he said, you've already prayed, now it's time to move, or now it's time to act. You've prayed, now it's time to act. You've prayed for X, Y, Z. You've prayed for the husband. You've prayed for the job. You've prayed for the success. You've prayed for the situation to be done. Now it's time to act. We've gone over the layout of the chessboard, the players, the pieces, the influences. We have gone over the purpose of the game, the life. Not allowing the enemy to freeze or, or, or stalemate you, not uh, allowing the enemy, not standing toe-to-toe with your fears and your traumas, and not submitting to other influences. We've gone over the instructions of the game. 
What I've learned from my time of competition, whether it be chess, uh, sports, family games, video games, etc., in any form of competition, first thing we have to understand is that we are in a competition for our own lives. Amen. We are in competition every day, every month, every year, every season for our own lives. We are competing to succeed while we have a very real enemy that is competing to stop us from succeeding. So you compete every single day. Amen. Um, in any form of competition or in any instance where you face a very real, very determined, and very divisive, conniving, cunning, and crafty opponent, because that's what the enemy is, we cannot allow them to make all of their moves. We can't allow them to do all of the moving. We cannot sit still. We cannot allow ourselves to become merely reactive, responsive believers yesterday. Hmm. Yesterday, 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 I almost lost my mind. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to, I'm just going to tell you the truth. Yesterday, I was, um, I was at my son's chess tournament. Both of them, they were in a chess tournament down at WC3D. And um, I was sitting there for nine hours, y'all. I was there for nine hours, and I didn't have my laptop. I didn't, I was like not prepared for this. I did not think it was going to be how it was i'll be ready for the next one but i was at a, a chess tournament for my sons and and so I, and as, as, as i was sitting there and i was kind of planning over and getting ready for today amen i um i was sitting there and there were two young men they came um and sat down before me it was because the parents couldn't go back there so I, it's not like i was like there watching my sons play i probably would have had more fun if i could but they sent the young people out so like there was a, a room where only the players could go parents couldn't go so i while i was sitting there while i was sitting there being idle um there were two young men that came and they sat in front of me there was a chess uh set up before me and they decided to play chess they started playing but they were playing a different form of chess they were playing what was called blitzing. Uh, they were they were doing blitzing. Now, uh, blitzing is, is still chess, um, and the core rules still apply. The, the point is still to stop the king. It didn't change the game. It just changed how the game was played. Um, the difference from what I observed was the speed in which the participants were moving. The driving force behind blitzing was that the time in which the players had to uh, had to move. It was severely limited. So what am I saying? When, you, when you're playing chess and when you're playing competitive chess, I don't know if any of you all have watched a competitive chess match, but, you know, the player moves and then they hit the clock. And then the other player moves and then they hit the clock. They're doing that because there's a set amount of time in the whole game that you have to – uh, to play, to either beat your opponent. So I, I think the average is about three minutes. What do you guys play when you play, Brandon? What's your time? 45 minutes. So you get 45 minutes to do all that you're going to do. Well, these two young men set the game at one minute. They went from 45 minutes, which is what I was going to say a nine-year-old is playing, all the way down to a minute. And what that means is there's a minute set on each side of the chessboard. And uh, the, both players only have one minute to less than a minute, like a, a minute for the whole game to make all of their moves in order to get a victory. So every time they're moving, boop, 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 and that minute is still checking out. Every time it's your turn, the clock starts running when it's your turn. And you have only so many time, so many seconds before you can make your move. And ultimately, whoever has the most points when the time wins out wins unless they take your king. Amen. So we have a severely different situation going on. I was sitting there and I, I had never seen this before in my life. I was just like, what are y'all doing? It got real intense. And so with these new extreme measures, players really don't have the ability to just play defensively. I, I spoke a couple weeks ago that there's different strategies. You can have offensive strategies and defensive strategies, and you got to be able to move, and you're, you're reactive. A lot of times in life, we are reactive. We don't do what we need to do. We respond to something that's already happened. We're not proactive. We are reactive. God is saying we don't have time anymore to be reactive. We don't have time anymore to be reactionary. When you live a reactionary life, what you're really doing is setting yourself up to live emotionally. Because your reactions are going to be rooted in how something makes you feel. 
Somebody say something mean to you, you get into your feelings, you get your feelings hurt, and now you want to cuss them out. Somebody hit you, your feelings hurt, you didn't like it, now you want to hit them back. Uh, your bills get cut off, now you want to go do something illegal in order to obtain the money that you don't have to pay the bills. You're in a relationship, they cheat on you, you got to cheat back. Your friends are having a good time, you got to go do something over the top. What's the new friend? Hold my beer. Somebody do something, you got you to gotta outdo them. Somebody strike here, you got to strike there. We are living in a time where we are completely reactionary and responsive to everything, but we're not proactive. And so um, we don't have time in, in the game yesterday. They didn't have time to do that because their moves were so, their time frame was so limited. I only got a little bit of time to make this happen, and I got to move forward. I don't have time to stop and figure out what you're trying to do, Why, at the same time I do got to figure out what you're trying to do because you're trying to stop me like I'm trying to stop you. With the new extreme measures, players didn't have the ability to just play defensively because their opponent was coming full force at them to defeat them, and their time was literally not on their side. They didn't have time on their side. Because of this, both players had to uh, be both extremely offensive, offensive and had to have the foresight to still be able to have counter moves for their opponents. This meant that they had to make a move and had to have about three moves ready to go depending on what their opponent did. So they had to move, but then they also had to have, they had to have a move ready in case their opponent countered them. They had to have a move ready in case their opponent didn't counter them. And then they had to have a move ready if they saw something that their opponent did that opened up something else for them. So they had to have, I had to move, but then I have to be ready because my opponent is moving so fast and they're trying to get me that I don't have time to study the board. I have to know the board. I got to see what they're going to do as they're doing it and know what that looks like. This meant that they have to make uh, moves three and they have to make a move and they have three moves ready. At times, both players were moving so fast that it appeared that they were moving at the same time. I saw one person move and then the other person was already had their hand on their piece and they was moving as the other one. They was like, it was like this. It was like, whoop, sh -doop, sh -doop, sh -doop. that's literally all their hand was moving because as they made a move, their opponent was making a move and they had to, and then they still had to get to the time. So sometimes it looked like they was touching pieces at the same time. Like, wait a minute, you can't go because he ain't with you. But he had already went so fast that it was time, it was your turn again. Because you got to be on the offensive. You got to keep moving forward. You got to keep going after the goal. You don't have time to sit there and wait for them to move again because they've already moved. So now it's back on you. It's back on you. No matter what, it's back on you. No matter what the situation looks like, it's back on you. No matter what is presented to you, it's back on you. No matter what the enemy gives and throws at your way, it's back on you. It doesn't matter what the enemy is saying, it's back on you. It doesn't matter what you don't have, it's back on you. It doesn't matter what you do have, it's back on you. Gotta keep moving. Amen. And so um, I wrote it. I got to say it. Uh, church, there is an enemy, like I said before, coming at us full force to defeat us. And we are literally running out of time. We're literally running. You're running out of time sitting here figuring out how you're running out of time. Time is against us. Amen. Time is not for me because I'm 32 and against you because you're over 50. Time is against me as well because I don't know the day nor the hour when the son of man shall come. We don't know when he's going to come back. We don't know when the, sound, when the horn is going to sound. We don't know when Jesus is going to come back. Looking for a church without a spot or a wrinkle or any such blemish. There is not a date set. It's not like Christmas, December 25th. It's not a day. The Bible didn't tell us that it was going to be a specific day in a specific year in a specific generation. So we are literally running out of time. Lives are being taken, whether by enemies or by the, pe the people who own their life. Well, nobody owns their life, but by the people who have their own lives. People are becoming increasingly wicked or even worse, sympathetic to sin. 
people are becoming easily compromised, lovers of themselves, cold-hearted, hurt by the world, hurt in the church, and there is no safety net to catch them. People are getting hurt in the world, and the very place that they're supposed to come to to get healing, they're getting hurt in the hospital. They're getting hurt in the church. There are so many people walking around saying, I have church hurt. How do you have hurt from the very place that God called you to come to? Not saying, I'm not saying that to dismiss those saying that they have church hurt. But then if people are screaming, if there are so many people screaming that they have church hurt, the church has to look at itself and its methods and how it is going about things. Because we are the spiritual hospital. We cannot be like the world. When people come in, they have to come in and be made whole. But now we're finding out that the struggle is getting them in, but we're not asking ourselves, why won't they come in? Amen. I, was have, I had a conversation a couple months ago, and um, somebody had mentioned to me, because I had said that I, I wasn't at the time, I was talking about myself, I, had, I wasn't at the time inviting people to go to a certain place of fellowship. It's like, ah, I don't invite people because I'm just trying to work some things out. And there was a direct response to me that said, wait a second. You know, you should never, you know, not be telling people that they shouldn't be going to church. And then so my response was, well, I have a I have a parable, if you will. I said the church is a, is a spiritual hospital. I said, yes. I said, OK, so let me put this out there to you. If you have a person in your family or a loved one that, you know, is sick, that, you know, needs to be healed. And there's a hospital that has a bad reputation for healing people. Are you going to take them to that hospital? You don't take them to the hospital where you hear that they're getting hurt instead of healed. You send them to the one that has a high recommendation of healing. So what, what am I saying? If the people won't come to the church, then the church has to put up a mirror and look at itself. Not because we're not doing a good job, but we're not only are we not bringing them in, but we're hurting them on the way out. We don't have enough time to be hurting people in the church. We don't have enough time to be attacking people, judging people, uh, uh, tearing people down. We got to encourage. We got to build. We have to edify. We have to love one another the way that Jesus told us to love one another. And sometimes that does mean I have to tell you that what you're doing is wrong, but there is a way to say it. Me and my wife were talking about that on the way over this morning. We were talking about a particular topic that I'm not going to bring up today, but this topic is so sensitive that it's almost like you can't talk about it. But at the same time, it has to be talked about. But you, but the way that the church has attacked said topic, nobody can hear them. If everything that comes out of your mouth is hurtful, you cannot get upset that nobody want to listen to you no more. Amen. You don't really learn that as until you get married or until you become a parent. I'm just going to be honest with you. <laughs> it's not until you get dealing with somebody else's emotions on a regular basis that you understand it's not what you say, but how you say it. I struggled with that the first five years of my marriage. I'm like, I just said it. She's like, it's not what you said. It's just how you said it. Sometimes you just sound angry for no reason. I'm like, I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated. Well, you sound angry and it hurt. Well, you sound and it hurt. Well, yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm just not going to talk no more. But that's not the answer either because we still got a problem that we have to fix. Amen? Amen. Um, uh, um, the world of media, oh, Lord. The world of media, including social media, is the leading form of influence, and the church has not properly combated and competed for influential control. Media controls everything. Media controls who we vote for. Media controls who we like, who we don't like, what we think is right, what we think is wrong. Media can literally tell you how you are to behave. You don't believe me? Look at all of these crazy, ridiculous TikTok challenges. Dancing is fine. Choking out your best friend to the point of blacking out makes no sense to me. But because I saw it on social media, it has influenced me. And I'm, I have to try it. So much to the point where we 
in our relationships, we think it's cool and we think it's cute to play little pranks on our spouses to the point where it's uh, shaking the very foundation of our trust with our spouses. You see people uh, pulling pranks about uh, being uh, uh, the cheating pranks on their boyfriend or their girlfriend or their spouse. And we think it's funny. We think it's cute and we think it's okay. And then anybody say that it's wrong, oh, y'all just stiff and oh, y'all just boring. Oh, y'all just, no, you're really, you don't even understand that you're, uh, you're messing with the trust that the person that you are married to or saying that you want to be with, you're affecting their ability to trust you how they need to trust you. So now when a scenario really comes around where I have to just be able to walk in trust, I can't because you've done so many things to affect my trust for the sake of a prank. Amen. I should be able to walk up to Sister Brianna and shake her hand and give her a nice little godly church hug and say thank you. And my wife shouldn't be cutting her corners of her eyes wondering what I'm doing because I ought to be trustworthy. I ought to be able to say something to my waitress that is a nice compliment if she's doing a good job without my wife or my spouse feeling like I'm doing something I don't have any business doing. I'm just being nice. But if you don't trust me, you'll be affected by my behavior. Amen. So with that being said, like I said, the media controls the influence of the world. The problem is the church is not combated that it has tried. It has attempted. I am guilty of being in the attempt and trying. We have tried to uh, sneak our way into media. Uh, all the churches are live streaming. We are on TVs now and we have TikTok. We have all, I see, I see churches, including our own. We on all the platforms, churches are pastors is on Twitter, the pastor and the churches on Instagram. And then the church and the pastor is on Facebook. I have, I just, Stayed away from Snapchat personally. I just don't know how to, didn't figure it out. But we are on, I just stayed away from it, bro. I don't, it's just not me. But we have tried to get in there as best as we can, but we fall short because in our attempt to be influential, we find ourselves trying to do what the world is doing. We're trying to remix every song on the radio, throw Jesus in it and act like an hour. It's a gospel song. It ain't a gospel song. There's not no anointing in that. You just saying, you just changed the words. All you did is change the words. You know, we're doing the challenges. We're saying uh, hard, crazy things. We're dropping one-liners, me and my wife. <laughs> me and my wife talk about this all the time. We be seeing, uh, we see a lot of people, um, who are kind of fancy themselves as preachers or whatever not, and they drop one-liners to be inspirational. And we'd be like, where's the scripture at behind what you're talking about? Can you please give me a scriptural reference? Why? Because the word of God is what solves everything. Stop trying to make people successful outside of God. Keep people successful in God and with God. Use the word to begin to get in there and work the hearts of the people and begin to not necessarily convict them, but the word will convict. But if we're going to encourage and influence people, we have to do it the way that God tells us to do it. And sometimes that means we have to season the world with the word of God, not the words of ourselves. We are running out of time. Amen. And so what we're doing is, Man, we trying to we trying to grow weed at the church, and I don't know what we got going on. We just and then we proud about it, and then the kingdom of God is now split because this side of the kingdom is saying about you know this side, and we don't understand. It's like, but you can't. We don't need to do everything. Everything ain't for the church to do. It's not for us to do. There's other ways if, if, if the, the and, I, and I understand where, where my brother is from. The church uh, is, 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 is a privately funded institute. It's a privately funded institution. The government uh, grants all of these people that give out money. A lot of times they tell you that you cannot label yourself as a religious institute or you automatically disqualify yourself from the access of funds. So the church is still a privately funded institute, talking about tithes and offerings. And my wife, she has a very big business mindset, and, you know, she's very um, instrumental in trying to establish what she calls vehicles for the ministry so that it can have a financial uh, stability and backing to go along with tithes and offerings. So it, it makes sense that to affix a business that can help fund the things of the church, but all businesses ain't for us to be a part of. All businesses are not for us to be in because at some point, if you want to run it as a business, really what you're also putting down is saying that you approve of what is being done at said business. 
That's why I never, I mean, anybody here ever fancy starting a strip club? No? Anybody? No? Okay. There's a reason why you never went and why that never crossed your mind, right? What I'm saying is, is everything is not for us. And if we continue to try to come, if we can't combat the world's influence by acting like the world. We can only combat the world's influence by being ourselves and being ourselves in love. Amen? So back to the game. Today, we're going to be on the offensive and doing so. There is some things we must be willing and ready to do. And we understand that success um, is going to come with sacrifice. So the strategy for success, I'm going to say this, I'm going to get through this, and I'm going to get us on out of here. Amen? Amen. In order to have success with and in God, um, one always has to, and uh, excuse me, a strategy in God that has success always has and always will involve sacrifice. Amen. In my uh, witness in the game yesterday, as I said, the players were moving so fast that they were constantly on the offensive. The strategy proved a very common move on both sides of the board, and that move was sacrifice. Uh, both players understood that in order to make a move, um, that move had to result in me losing a piece. In order for me to make move two, I had to be okay with losing piece number one. Um, in order for me to move forward and for me to be able to take a bishop, I had to lose a pawn. And in order for me to take a knight, I had to lose a knight or I had to lose a bishop. The goal, though, stayed the goal. And no matter what, um, no matter what I give up, losing the king was not an option. Because once you lost the king, you lost the game. Amen. So that's the thing. Remember, you are the king on the chessboard. So it does not matter what you, it does matter what you are willing to give up in order to have success. But the one thing that you cannot give up is on yourself. The one thing in this whole game of life that you cannot afford to give up, that you cannot afford to expose is yourself. You have to protect yourself at all costs. You have to be willing to protect what you have, who you are at the very core of your foundation. You must protect you no matter what. Abraham, Abraham, now we into the text. Abraham, uh, father of many nations, the first of a chosen people, worked in his strategy in excellent, he worked this strategy in excellent uh, fashion. Um, as it is written prior to, to the sacrifice of emphasis, the, 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 the scripture, the text that we're talking about, we're going to do a little case study today on Abraham. We are introduced uh, to Abraham in all facets of the game. I talked about last week, the facets of the game, we got to face our, uh, our, our traumas, our fears and stuff. We have to be willing to walk away. We have to be willing to sever relationships. So Abraham kind of did about just about everything I've talked about. He's done. He's done it all. Um, we start out. Abraham is called away from his family to go to a land that he will be shown rather than just outright knowing where he is going. Praise God. Um, Abraham faces a task that we continue to struggle with today because we have been taught to collect as much information as possible as we can before we move rather than moving according to the spirit. Well, Galatians 5 and 25 says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. What am I talking about? Abraham was living with his, uh, his family in a land, and God came and spoke to him and said, Abraham, you're going to go to a land that I will show you, a land of milk and honey. Amen. God did not say where. He did not call out the name of the place. He did not exactly give him directions. At the time, he said, go. Take your wife. Take your camp go the problem is that we will have in today's society is google maps we got to know exactly where we're going we got to have all the who gonna be over there I, don't, I need to know who gonna be there what time the food gonna be ready is so-and-so gonna have their kids there how long are we supposed to be there is y'all gonna have some drinks who cooked it who made the potato salad we got to know everything about the situation before we move how much it cost god said just go Go. Say that with me. Say, go. That's what God said. He said, go. Amen. And so um, his first uh, sacrifices, he first sacrifices the comfort of his father's land. 
He sacrifices the familiarity of knowing where his brothers and sisters were in case anything ever went wrong. He sacrifices the trust of his wife as she will willingly go with him, but because she did not, because she did not hear the call, um, the receiver of her, first, of her frustration in a difficult situation will not be God, it will be Abraham. He's sacrificing his relationship with his wife. Here we go, married people. <laughs> When God tells you to do something and you have to be obedient to God, you have to be willing. I ain't say willing to get a divorce, but you have to be willing, willing to be in opposition of your spouse for a time. You have to be willing to oppose. This is why it is very important to make sure that you are properly yoked up with somebody in marriage because a person that got hot, uh, has for you won't oppose the call of God on your life as hard as a lot of people deal with. Thank God for my wife, Allison. I heard the call and it was a struggle. It was a struggle, but she ultimately said, okay, if he called you, amen. And then what, what we found out was he called her too. So what happens is, so we, we didn't see what Sarah had to say about God calling Abraham. We just saw Abraham go. Amen. We didn't see her emotional reaction. We didn't see what she had to say, but she went. Amen. So that was already a good thing, but he had to deal with whatever she had to say if anything went wrong. And boy, did some things go wrong. Some things went wrong. So I can only imagine when things, you know, I'm married and, and spouses do it to each other. It's not just women to me, and I ain't going to say that. When things go wrong and it was because of something you did, your spouse going to let you know about it. Your spouse going to let you know. Man, why you do that? Amen. So, 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 um, he, he, he sacrifices the trust of his wife because if it all goes wrong, he got to deal with it. Not God. Cause she didn't hear the call from God. She heard the response from Abraham. He then has to sacrifice the close relationship he has with his nephew, Lot. Lot went with him, but Lot was not called to be with him. Here we go. It's another area of sacrifice. Um, you have to be willing to sacrifice the relationship that God has not ordained for you in a particular season. You have to be willing to sacrifice the relationship that God has not ordained for you in a season. Now, that's what, notice I said in a season. I didn't say forever because we have some forever folks in some temporary bodies. I don't understand how we operate this way. This is what we do. Amen. And I, I see it increasingly. Oh, they ain't been, if you ain't been calling me, if you don't like none of my posts, if you don't, then I'm just going to unfriend you. Why? Why are we so offended by people not reaching out to us? If we would get with God, we would understand that the season that you in in your life right now, God has just not ordained that relationship. It does not mean that they do not care about you. It does not mean that they are no longer your friend. It does not mean that they no longer have something that they can offer you. But right now, God has cut them off from you because he's trying to do something for you, with you, through you, take you somewhere that they may not be able to go. But, you know, we, we, we like being beefed out with everybody. We, we like getting into our feelings. We are reactionary. You haven't called me in three months, so now that must mean you hate me. You have not checked on me in two months that, or two weeks. That must mean that we are not as close as I thought we were. You are still friends. There is still a relationship. They are not called for this season in your life. Amen. And so uh, throughout his life, Abraham is faced with sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. Yet in his obedience to what God's presenting him, he is getting blessed along the way. If you read and if you go through, you will see the promises of God and the blessings of God and everything that God had for Abraham while he was being obedient unto God. Is that all right? Unto the promise of of a son. Now, Abraham and his wife were old. They were very old. They were so old that conception was naturally impossible for them. However, because God, because of the promise of uh, God and the promise that God made to Abraham and the obedience that Abraham extended towards God, God made a way. Now, I'm going to say this and I'm going to hop in. If you want God to be making ways in your life, if you want the favor of God, if you want God to do what he needs or that you want him to do in your life, you must adopt a spirit of obedience. 
This thing does not work with you doing what you want to do and getting what you want at the same time. As they say, you cannot have your cake and eat it too. Amen. It works like that. You learn that as a child. In order for me to get that thing that I wanted for Christmas, I had to do what I was supposed to do around the house. I had to make sure myself the same way. That's the same way God is. If you want God to make ways in your life, if you want favor amongst your bosses, if you want to be able to go forward in life the way that uh, God has for you, you have to adopt obedience. It don't work without it. Amen. Um, now, again, here is the enemy moving. I told you in, in blitzing, we blitzing now. We in the full blitz mode. As we move, the enemy moves. As we counter, the enemy counters. He's always going to do it. It's just a part of life. Amen. Um, just as Abraham is moving and doing well, God has made Abraham a promise. He promised Abraham that his seed will be blessed and promised him a child through his wife. Uh, almost as sim simultaneously as the word uh, has was spoken, Sarah came first with the logical doubt and fleshly solutions. As soon as God practically said it, amen, she already had a way to break with God, uh, an alteration to what God's plan was. Your answer to a spiritual promise cannot be met with natural logic. Your answer to a spiritual promise cannot be met with natural logic. They don't go together. Amen. The natural is just a manifestation of what has already taken place in the spiritual. God already had a promise for Abraham that existed beyond the natural. So it was supernatural. He already promised to do this for him generation after generation and time after time. And so what Sarah's response was, was an alteration to what God had already promised. Amen. Um, An influence the enemy has presented um, in this. A lot of times the enemy will um, he'll present an insurance to God. God don't need insurance because God don't make no mistakes. God's word is true. His promises are yes and amen. God is not a man that he shall lie, nor the son of man that he shall repent. He don't need a backup. God don't need a backup. Amen. And so but what our natural minds does uh, exactly what Sarah did here. Sarah tells Abraham to go make a child with her handmaiden Hagar because uh, Sarah was what was qualified as barren and she could not have children. Their natural customs allowed this to take place. So legally and customarily, that was OK. I don't, I don't want us to get uh, um, misconstrued. Abraham did not sin with Hagar customarily and naturally and legally what he did with Hagar was allowed. Amen. Um, so it was okay. But in the area of faith, this is how we operate. We don't deal in the area of customs and natural and legality. We deal in the area of faith, but in the area of faith, it was one of the worst things he could have done. We cannot allow ourselves to be led and driven by the legality or customs of our society, especially when they come in direct opposition to the promises and instructions of God. Now, because God is not a liar nor sl uh, or slack concerning his promises, he fulfills the promise. He still does what he said he was going to do, despite Abraham already knowing having a son, um, but despite already now having a son but with him and Hagar, he even has a blessing for the child, Ishmael, not Isaac, Ishmael. God still even has a blessing for Abraham's mess. That's the faithfulness. That's the love that our, the, of the God that we serve. He even has a blessing a lot of times for our mess. We'll mess up something real bad and he can still bless it should he choose to. But remember, all of these years of Abraham sowing obedience into the God of his salvation, into the God of his faith, that God decided to make a way. I said a couple of minutes ago, if you want God to keep making a way, if you want him to keep blessing you, you have to adopt a spirit of obedience. And the spirit of obedience will not always have immediate results. Sometimes you being obedient today can bless the next generation. Ishmael is not blessed because he just is so blessed. He's blessed because of his father. Amen. You and I are blessed because sometimes of our parents and our grandparents for the prayers that went forth, for the obedience that goes forth. So it, and when I say be obedient today, it will it will have some results today, but it will affect your children and your children's children and your children's children's children. You may not see the fruit of, of your obedience tomorrow, but somebody will. Amen. 
And so here uh, Ishmael has been blessed. Amen. And now we are here on Isaac and God still fulfills his promise. Um, and, and so he fulfills the promise that he was already made despite what Abraham did because he is a forgiving God and he is a loving God and he will make a way for those who make a way for him. Uh, fast forward to the time of the text right here in 22 and 9. Abraham has shown himself to be a man of obedience and a strong track record full of sacrifice. His son of promise is Isaac. He's a young man. He's somewhere about 12 years old. Abraham is now enjoying his promise when he hears the Lord again. He's then had the son, he's raising the son, he's teaching the son how to be a man, and he's going through all of the things that fathers do when they have sons, parents do when they have children, amen? Uh, and then he hears the Lord again. He hears him again. This time instructing him to use Isaac as a sacrifice unto God. Now, if you continue to read your Bible, you know how, well, we read it already. So we know how it ends. But can you imagine in the moment that he heard the Lord? Take your son. I want you to offer him up to me as a, as a sacrifice, as an offering. Take him up to the mountains. I'm going to show you where to go. We're going to tie him down. We're going to do what you have done with offerings before. It's not like a brand new thing. He's, uh, he's made offerings before. He's made sacrifices before using animals. Same thing. Go take your son. A lot of times that can be intimidating. Why would, why would God, number one, ask us to kill our children? And we stop. And we like, oh, no, God can't be this good. But God knows what he's doing. That's the problem. We be trying to, again, logically understand God. You cannot logically understand a supernatural God because your logic is rooted in it's a short, temporary version of thinking. God's thinking is unlimited. God's thinking is so unlimited that when he said, let there be light, the sun was created. Actually, he just said light appeared which means he was there. The son was created later. So what I'm saying is, is we cannot try to figure out God with our limited thinking and understanding. Our job is to just obey. Amen. And so um, Abraham enjoying the sacrifice. All of this time, Abraham has spent obeying and leading and leaving and praying and offering and relationships being rocked and, 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 and we having issues between my wife and the lady I had a, a child with. And, and even though my wife was the one who told me to do it and, and me and my nephew ain't cool no more. And he went to live in a world in a place that was, that was condemned. And now he's missing somewhere in the mountains and we've been kidnapped and we've been blessed and we've had to move and we've had to do and we've had to go but you still gave me my son. You still gave me that job I asked for. You still gave me that husband I prayed for. You still gave that, that situation that I've been asking that you know that I needed, that you know that I wanted. You gave it to me. You want it back? Can, you, can we do it? Can we, can, we give up the, can we give up the dream job? Can we give up the relationship? Can we turn down the passion? Man, I was, <laughs> I was, um, earlier this year, I was getting ready. I was getting ready to, um, look for a new coaching job. Uh, my, my previous head coach, she had been fired and, um, I had applied to replace him. I didn't get it. And so. I was sitting there and I was thinking, I was wondering, and I had a place. The new head coach called me. He said, hey, I want you to come on. I want you to continue doing what you were doing last year. I want you to really work with us. I want you to really take these kids to the next level. I had heard nothing but good things about the gentleman. I knew the kids. I knew the school. I was in place. There was nothing wrong with me returning except for one thing. I was told not to coach. My wife didn't tell me not to coach. Pastor didn't tell me not to coach. My other coaching friends didn't tell me not to coach. God was like, you're done. I, I need this. I need this year back. I said, what? I'm three years in. I'm building up a reputation. I'm building these great relationships. I'm getting ready to take this thing to the next level. He said, you're done. And so, 
I called, I called the new coach. I said, hey, I appreciate you. You know, I, I really appreciate you, you know, holding on and this is going back for me. I can't coach this year. Can't do it. And, and I told him, I was like, I'm a man of faith. And my faith has told me that I have to take this year off. And he was like, what? I was like, I can't do it. And the other coaches was calling. They was like, you're not going back. You're not coming back. I was like, I can't do it, fellas. And I had to answer for my absence. And I had to answer and I had to break away because I had to give up my passion for my purpose. So here we go. The, 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 the key, the, the, the uh, all in all to success is sacrifice, right? What is it that we got to sacrifice? We have to sacrifice those things that we have put before God. Well, what do you mean? Those things you put before God. A lot of times I've, me and my wife talk about this all the time. We have what we call passions in life. Oh, I got to be this and I want to be that. And we develop them as kids. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be such and such. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be NBA basketball player, whatever, whatnot. And so our passion becomes the very driving force in everything that we do, every relationship that we have, everybody that we talk to, everything that we do, our passion is what takes precedence. And let me say this before I go further. It's not that God doesn't care or it's not that God doesn't want you to enjoy things in life. It's not that God doesn't want you to have things. It's not that God doesn't want you to do things. But God said that I am the creator. And guess what, though? There was something that was set in place before you were born that keeps you from me that I need to make sure is right before you die. There was sin. There was separation. You don't have access to me. There was sin. There was separation. You don't have access to me. And so what God decided to do, and he said, hey, you don't have access to me, and I need you. So in order for you to have success, in order for me to be successful with me to you and you to me, I have to make the ultimate sacrifice. The enemy has been moving. The enemy has been doing. The enemy tempted Eve in the garden, and now I got to make another move. It's on you, talking about God. And so what did he do? He sent his son down through 42 generations so that we could, so he could have success through us. I said that Jesus was the most important piece on the board next to you. Why? Because he can move and do and, and cover, and he has made it a way for you to be successful in everything that you do as it pertains to your spiritual life. All you have to do is accept him as your Lord, as your Savior, as that, 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 that piece of atonement, as the Lamb of God, as the sacrifice, as the way to set things right. Jesus is the sacrifice for success. Amen. And so as we are working through and as we are getting through with Abraham, as we uh, you see that Abraham goes forward and he goes up and he takes his son. He takes him up there. He lays him down. He gets ready to take him out. He gets ready to kill him. And then God calls back out and say, don't touch him. I just wanted to see if you were willing to. See, a lot of times in our lives, God is just trying to see what we are willing to do in order to please him. How far we are willing to go? How far? How many relationships are you willing to sever in order to please God? How many jobs are you willing to turn down in order to fulfill your purpose? The thing is, we have to get to a place where our passion aligns with our purpose. Too many times we're trying to do things that has nothing to do with God and we're calling it our passion and we're wondering why we are doing these things and we're not being fulfilled. He's not the message, but when I look at celebrities who kill themselves, when I look at people who are rich and strong and have the things and have everything that they need, but they are still depressed and they are still sad and they are still, because you're not fulfilling your purpose. Your purpose resides in God. It does not mean uh, everybody is a preacher. It does not mean everybody is a prophetess. It does not mean everybody is an evangelist. But whatever it is, it is for the kingdom. A lot of times, a lot of people say God ain't for everybody. That is the lie. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God is for everybody. Everybody ain't for God. 
God is for everybody. God desires that no one should perish, but that everybody has everlasting life. God wants every single one of us to be reunited, reinstated, re, uh, re uh, excuse me, come on, help me, help me, help me, uh, re have a reestablished relationship with him. He desires every single one of us to make it back to heaven, but we don't always want to choose God. We choose relationships. We choose vices. We choose to enjoy the things of this world. This world will pass. And yes, you only get one life, YOLO. But guess what? You, there is so much to this life that you can enjoy in God if you will be willing to sacrifice the things that are not of God. And the things that are not of God that we are using in, as vices to fulfill the voids in our lives instead of God is, where, is how we get sin. You didn't receive the love that you needed to as a young man or a young woman, so a young woman. So you've turned to fornication. You've made that the feeling, the feeling void for what you didn't have. God has more for you. You're struggling because you struggled in school. So now you're not educated. And so the, what the thing is now is you don't have enough money to sustain. So now you're going to result into stealing and killing and doing whatever it is. That's sin. It's not what God has for you. It's not what the faith has for you. It's time for us to, uh, again, we are literally running out of time. Every single day we are running out of time. Every single second, every single minute we are running out of time. There are too many people killing themselves. There are too many people leaving this earth that don't really have an opportunity to receive the God of their salvation. Because we those of us who are here, those of us who do know, we don't want to sacrifice. And success is, is, is subjective. Success is subjective. You can be successful and never have done anything of, no, of any notoriety because you can be successful in God. There are people who have never made a million dollars and will never see a million dollars, will never touch a microphone, will never do anything like that, and they are some of the most successful people in the world. Sometimes being successful is getting your daughter to go to college. Sometimes being successful is making sure that your child graduated from high school. There's more to it after. I want you to be, I want to encourage you to keep going. But you do not have to have a certain level of fame in order to call yourself successful. Success is not a fix to fame. Success is doing the will of God in your life. So the success of sacrifice is simple. First, we must sacrifice being selfish and being prideful and figuring out our purpose. Jesus had a purpose. Jesus came. He fulfilled his purpose. He died and left. He could have been anything. Jesus was a carpenter. He was the son of a carpenter. He had a good trade. He was known. He had a thing. But he came to do the will of the father that sent him. That's why we're still talking about him. Paul was successful. Paul was not a millionaire. <laughs> Paul spent most of his ministry in prison. But we still talk about him because he was successful. Abraham, <laughs> successful. There are characters. There are characters. I don't mean to say characters as if they weren't real. There are uh, people in the Bible who had all types of success that you don't necessarily affix to rich. They weren't all poor and broke neither, but that's another conversation for another day. Um, so what am I saying? The success of sacrifice. God will succeed you. He will cause you to have success. And he will cause you to have good success. But are you willing to make the sacrifice to be successful? Are you willing to put this world down and pick up what God has for you today? Are you? Because if you're not, I'm going to tell you right now, anything outside of God is failure. I don't care what it looks like. The Bible, the Revelation will tell you that. Anything outside of God, the will of God, the choosing of God is failure. It is failure. You can enjoy all the things of this world, but your eternal life is what matters the most. What profit is the man to gain the world and lose his soul? Don't lose your soul for today. 
and y'all my family. Mostly, you know, y'all y'all my family. I I enjoy I enjoy my life. I enjoy this life. I have a good time. I have I've been thank God when I'm done. I'm married to a beautiful woman. I have four beautiful children. I have a mother who loves me. I have a father who loves me. I have family who loves me. I have fun with my friends. I do all of that. And I still chose God. And I'm still enjoying this life. There are things that I have to give up that are inside of me that I don't necessarily always want to give up. But I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I know that what I lose today, I gain way more when it's all said and done. Faith makes me able to sacrifice for success. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want, um, I want us to be transparent in this moment. I want us to be transparent in this moment. Um, if you have anything that you know you need to sacrifice, I really mean that you know that you need to give up for God. I want you to come to the altar right now. It's, it's, it's one thing to it's one thing to say, you know, Lord, I believe and Lord, I know and Lord, I see. But God is asking for us to sacrifice. I'm not here to call out what that sacrifice is. I'm not here to call out nobody's personal life. But I want you to bring your sacrifice to the altar. Bring your sacrifice to the altar.